Well, there's one thing that's never in question, and that is the goodness of God. Uh, That never changes and never will. And I think about all of the times uh, that the world's kind of been upside down for me. You know, God has never, ever changed. Y'all heard the story about the old boy who uh, was in the hospital, and he had uh, tubes running out of tubes. I mean, he was in bad shape, ICU, ventilator, the whole nine yards. And he was able to talk a little bit, and his wife, Ethel, was right there beside him. And uh, he looks up at Ethel, and he says, uh, Ethel, do you remember right after we first got married, and uh, I had that terrible car crash, and and you... uh, You stayed right with me all during those weeks in the hospital and through my rehab, you never left me. You were always right there. And and then Ethel, you remember uh, when I fell off the roof and I broke my back and uh, man, I was in that body cast forever. And and every day you just took care of me and watched after me and ministered to me. And, And then Ethel, when I got that horrible case of shingles and it, it just really, uh, did a number on me, and, and I couldn't hardly function for months on end. And Ethel, you were always right there. You were just right by my side. You never left me. And now, Ethel, here I am. I, I'm, I'm, looks like I'm not going to make it. Um, twilight of my life. Days are numbered. And I look up, and Ethel, you're still right here with me. You've never left me. You, you know, Ethel, I, I've just come to believe that you've been a bad luck about all our marriage. Uh, You know, we're all going to have bad days, aren't we? Life is filled with tough days. Life is filled with difficulties and hardships. As a matter of fact, life is filled with impossible situations. We're going to be faced many times in this life, not just right now, not just in these days, uh, but young people uh, that are watching and listening Understand that life is filled with impossible situations. I hope you have a copy of the Word of God and uh, you'll turn over there with me uh, today into Daniel chapter number two. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning about what to do when you don't know what to do. Where do you go when there's no place to turn? What do you do when you don't know what to do? Now, Daniel was a prisoner of war by the time that he was 17 years old. But by the time that he reaches 80 to 85, somewhere along there, he's actually running the kingdom. He is next to the king of the empire. Uh, But Daniel faced a lot of challenges in his life. As a matter of fact, if you read this whole book, you'll discover that there were about nine different tests that God put Daniel through uh, before he finally got to that pinnacle of his life. It was one test after another. In Daniel chapter 2, he's facing an impossible uh, situation. I want you to look with me now, beginning in verse number 1 of chapter 2, and we're going to read pretty extensively here Uh, for a few minutes. So uh, notice what the word says. Uh, In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar uh, dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled and his sleep broke from him. He was sleepless. Then the king commanded to call the magicians and the astrologers, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, for to show the king his dreams. So they came and they stood before the king. And the king said unto them, I've dreamed a dream, and my spirit was troubled to know the dream. Now watch what the Chaldeans, and watch what the sorcerers did. Uh, they they speak to, uh, to the king in Syria, O king, live forever. Tell us what the dream is, and we will show the interpretation. Now the king had been aware for a long time, obviously, that these men seemed to be a bunch of fakes. And so he wasn't going to tell them the dream and so they could make up some big story about it. He said, well, I really want you to tell me the dream first and then I want you to tell me the interpretation. Now now watch this. 
Uh, he said to them, this, the, the thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream, which the interpretation uh, said, you'll be cut in pieces and your houses shall be a dunghill. But if you show the dream and the interpretation, uh, you'll receive the gifts and rewards uh, and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and the interpretation thereof. They answered again and said, let the king uh, tell his servants the dream and we'll show you the interpretation of it. The king answered and said, I know of a certainty that you would gain the time because you see the thing is gone from me. But if you will not make known unto me the dream, there is but one decree for you, for you have prepared lying. See there, here he's saying, I know what you're going to do. You prepared lying and corrupt words to speak before me till the time be changed. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me the interpretation thereof. Chaldeans answered before the king and said, uh, there is not a man on earth that can show the king's matter. Therefore, there is no king, Lord, nor ruler that asks such thing of any magician or astrologer or Chaldean. And, and it's a rare thing that the king requireth. And there is none other that can show it before the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this cause... The king was angry and furious and commanded to destroy all the wise men in Babylon. And the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain. And they sought Daniel and his fellows to be slain. Now, the king was terribly upset to know uh, what this dream that he had had that kept him up for nights. And he was angry because nobody could tell him and uh, uh, th this th this anger was coming and stemming from the fact that he wanted to know what the future held what, what, what's going to happen down the road Do you know that ingrained in the human psyche is this innate desire to know what's going to happen uh, to know what's in the future to know what is ahead in our life and here's the reason. If we can know what is ahead in our life, then we can control the situation. But if we don't know what's coming, if we don't know what's ahead, then we have no ability to control the situation. Now, here's the deal. Listen to this. Listen to this statement. You ready for this? God doesn't want you to be in control. He wants you to trust Him. Um, you see, if we do know the future, then we have this somehow ability to control what happens. Have y'all ever been around somebody that has this innate desire in their heart to control everything and everybody? Do you know that stems from insecurity? And an insecure person, they want to manage everything. They want to control everything. They want to embrace everything. Uh, and, 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 a, and a secure person doesn't have that need. Well, you just do your own deal. I'll do my own deal. And they don't have to control uh, somebody else. Right today, as I'm standing here delivering this message, uh, numerous people are trying to ask the question, what does tomorrow hold? What does the future look like? Where are we headed? What can I expect down the road? And the reason that they're asking those questions is, is because they kind of lost control of the situation. They have become desperate and they're finding themselves basically in a hopeless situation. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had a nightmare. And he called the psychics. He called the soothsayers. Uh, he called the fortune tellers and the card readers and everybody else. Tell me about my dream. Tell me what the dream was. And tell me uh, what that dream means. And the response back from every one of them was... Well, King, you're asking us to do something that's not possible. You're asking us to do the impossible. Now, Daniel is 17 years old, uh, just a teenager. And now then at 17, because the wise men of Nebuchadnezzar's day could not respond to his request, Nebuchadnezzar says, I want all of the wise men in the kingdom to be wiped out they're useless they're worthless and so that included then Daniel and his friends 
Now, I want to stop for a little bit this morning, and I want to show you what Daniel did when he was faced with assassination, when he was faced with an impossible situation. Uh, I've extrapolated a few things uh, out of the Word, and really, uh, I've practiced most of these things uh, all my ministry. And uh, I believe you'll find it helpful. So if you have a pen and a paper, write it down. Uh, Matter of fact, my devotions this morning uh, came out of the fact that when God speaks, uh, you ought to write it down because the enemy's going to come and he's going to try to steal that away from you. And if you will write it down, you can then trust what God has said to you uh, out of the Word. Now, uh, for 37 years, Uh, Matter of fact, it'll be 37 years in a couple of weeks uh, that I've been pastor here. We faced impossible situations many times before. Uh, Here's kind of the, uh, what's the recipe? It's a good word. Here's the recipe, I think, that every one of us could benefit from uh, if uh, we just go by. And we learn it by the way that Daniel responded. First of all, number one, write this down. Panic is not an option. Now, the fact of the matter is, is somebody tells me that I'm going to be assassinated by the government, I, I might be tending to panic. But Daniel never panicked. Look at verse 14. Daniel answered with counsel and wisdom. Now notice, he, he didn't answer uh, with an emotional outburst. He answered uh, with counsel and wisdom to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard who had been sent there to assassinate him uh, and slay the other wise men of Babylon. So he responded uh, not out of panic, but out of counsel and out of wisdom. I want to ask you a question this morning. Everybody, uh, what are you panicking about today? What's got you in a tizzy? Has the virus got you in a tizzy? Does your job have you in a tizzy? What about your bank account and uh, the money shortages that you might be facing? Or maybe there's some overwhelming debt uh, that you have that has created panic in your life. And maybe it may be a health issue uh, that you're panicking about because you don't know the extent of the health problem that you're facing and you're panicking because of what it could be. And you're just in a turmoil. Maybe you're facing some difficulty in your marriage that you never dreamed that you would face. And and, and it's got you all bound up and it's got you all in a panic. Maybe it's the future. You're just worried about what's going to happen down the road. Can I just say a word to you? Don't panic. Don't panic. Let me give you the second thing that I see here in the passage is that Daniel posed the right questions. Watch this, if you will, in verse number uh, 15, if you will. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree so hasty from the king? Then Arioch made the thing known to Daniel. Now, the king was really tore up. I I mean, he was distraught. Uh, He was in a panic. He was furious because he wanted to know uh, the future. Now, what was fueling all of this anger? I want to tell you why. He was afraid. He let fear dominate his life. He was scared to death. And, And he was literally saying to those wise men around him, you have to tell me what my dream was. You have to tell me what it means. Um... Notice what was going on now. Ariel was sent over to kill Daniel. Daniel says to him, now wait a minute. What brought all this about? And Ariel said, well, the king's just messed up. Now now you understand when somebody's coming down on you, uh, in all probability, whoever's coming down on you, there's somebody that's coming down on them. uh, Just like it was with uh, Ariel. Uh, They are likely to be pressed by someone else and they're feeling the heat. And and the only thing that they know to do is to turn the heat up on you. Now, now, uh, here's what what, uh, Daniel was doing. 
He said, now, wait a minute, Ariel. I understand you've got a job to do, but uh, I, I just want to drill down just a minute, and I don't want to react in feelings here. Uh, I want to get the facts straight. So I'm going to ask you some questions. Well, what, what in the world is the king doing? Why is he so upset? Why is he so angry? I want to get the facts. I like what Johnny Hunt says from time to time. He says, facts are our friends. And, and he says, I, I don't want to just you know, go off on what is happening emotionally here. What's the real deal in this matter? I, I, I looked at a passage yesterday that kind of blew me away. And it's in Proverbs 23, 23. And the word of God says, buy the truth, no matter how much it costs, and hold on to it. That's a strong word, isn't it? Get hold of, of the facts. Don't make any major decisions on emotions. And I watch people make those mistakes all of the time. They get real emotional about something and they, they, they will fly off the handle and go do something based on emotions rather than the facts and they wind up making the wrong decision. So you ask the question, what's going on here? What's really happening? What, what's the bottom line of this thing? Why are these things happening? And what do I need to do to fix this? Uh, what do I need to know about these things before we go any further? Now, the next thing I watched Daniel do is that he pleaded for more time to get hold of the solution to the problem. Uh, watch this in verse 16. Then, I, I like that word then. We're going to come back to that in a minute. That's a powerful word. Then Daniel went in and desired of the king that he would give him time and that he would show the king the interpretation my goodness immediately Daniel goes to the king he goes to the very source of the problem uh, that's very important now he could have made a quick decision uh, he says to the king now king uh, slow down just a little bit back up a little bit give me a little bit of time here and I believe I can figure this thing out with God's help. I don't know what the dream is. I don't know what the interpretation is. But I know somebody who does. And King, if you'll give me a little time, I'll go before God. And I am convinced that God will make it known to me if you'll just give me a little time to get with him. But, but that, that, that word then... He didn't wait. When he got with Ariel, he said, what's the real problem? What's the, what's the bottom line here? And as soon as Ariel explained something, what immediate, immediately Daniel went to the king. He went to the source uh, of the problem. He didn't put it off. He didn't procrastinate it. Uh, there are some versions that say immediately Daniel went. Suddenly Daniel went. He didn't put it off and he didn't procrastinate. He went to the source of the pressure. I'm going to ask you a question this morning. And I really want you to be honest with yourself. I want you to be honest before God. And I want to ask you, what are you putting off? What are you procrastinating? Uh, what are you reluctant really to deal with uh, in your life? There's some issues that are in your life that you've needed to deal with for years and years and years, but you're afraid of the ramifications if you do. Uh, you're afraid of the results if you do, because you know it could be, it might be painful. And so you just kind of put it off. I want to ask you another question. What are you really pretending that's okay even though you know it's not? What are you pretending that everything is all right about when deep down in your heart you, you, you know that that issue is not right? I suspect that there are some of you that are in a marital relationship right now 
that you've got some major issues that need to be dealt with, but for years and years and years, you've been sweeping it under the rug. I want to tell you something about that. You keep sweeping it under the rug, and it's going to produce a hill that you're going to trip over one of these days. So you just keep putting it off. What are you pretending in your life that's really not a problem? You say, well, Pastor, I, I got this little old thing that I, you know, I've, I've been dealing with. And, 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 uh, I, but I, I've really got this weakness that's in my life. But, but I got this. I, I got it. I, I don't like doing it. But for some reason, I just keep doing it over and over again. Let me just say to you this morning, that's not a weakness. That's an addiction. And it's something that you need to deal with. It's not just your little faux pas. It's not your little mistake. It's a major issue that's going to bring you down if you don't learn to deal with it and deal with it quickly. You understand something. Listen very closely. Procrastination only makes your problems worse. It's never going to make them better. Somebody said to me the other day, and I, it just rings in my ears, and I've, I've already had to deal with it a couple of times with people personally, and, and, and it just, I don't know, God just prepared me for that moment. And, and they say, well, you know, Pastor, time heals all wounds. No, it doesn't. If you believe that, the next time that you get sick, don't call the doctor. Just go sit down somewhere and just say, you know, time heals all wounds and there's no use me going to get a prescription, no use me going to get a doctor. I'll just sit here until it gets better. No, you're going to sit there till you die. Time doesn't heal wounds. The only way that you will ever be able to manage the fear in life is to meet that fear head on, to come against it. You can't argue yourself out of fear you can't talk yourself out of fear. The only thing that you can do is move against that fear and quit pre procrastinating what you know that you need to deal with. All right? Now, let me give you number four. I love this next one. Practice praying with your friends. Practice praying with your friends. Watch verse 17. Then Daniel went to his house and made the thing known uh, to Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, his companions, that they would desire mercies of the God of heaven concerning the secret that Daniel and his fellows should not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Now Nebuchadnezzar is about to kill every wise person in the kingdom, including Daniel and his friends. And when Daniel found out that a warrant has been rest, uh, sentenced to him uh, dead or alive. Uh, we, we prefer him dead. I just want you to go kill him. I, I'm, a, I'm in an assassination threat here. First thing that he did, i got to get to my friends, and, and we got to get to God about this thing. we got to pray about i got to get my prayer warriors going on this. Let me ask you a question. You ready for this? Uh, do you have any prayer warriors in your life? How many of you have prayer warriors in your life? If I were to uh, ask you to name me five people in your life that you consider prayer warriors, could you do it? Could you name five people that you pick up the phone or you text or you email or you meet and you say, you know what, I've got this going on, and I, this is an issue in my life, and uh, I, I really want you to pray. Who would you call if your back got up against the wall and you needed God to move in your life? Who would you call to enlist them to pray for you? I'm just thinking about the times where we are as the body of Christ right now and, and, and how much uh, all of this has exposed the necessity for small groups. And I'm really thrilled that many of you small groups are getting together and watching the broadcast. And many of you are getting together and praying. And, and, and many of you uh, have, have gone on Zoom and you're doing the video chats and all of that stuff. That's awesome. And it just shows all of us uh, how necessary it is that we surround ourselves with people that are going to seek God on our 
behalf. So important that in these days, we have people that we can call on to pray. So you don't panic. You ask the right questions. You get some time to seek after the solution. You get people praying for you. And watch this fifth one. You ready? Is you pray and prepare for supernatural help. Now, I'm talking about the kind of help that you can't come up with in your own wisdom. The kind of help that you will never muster up uh, as a result of your own abilities and your talents. Uh, the kind of help that uh, you've not been educated for. It's the kind of help that if God doesn't provide, you're not going to get it. Supernatural help. Now, here's the deal. You pray and you ask God and then you expect that God's going to do something uh, in response to your request. You know what's so interesting to me? Well, this is an encouraging word. I, I already, I'm about to shout because I know what I'm about to say. You know what's interesting? God wants to give us supernatural help. God wants to respond to our requests. He wants to come alongside of us. He wants to meet our needs. And he's just waiting on us to ask him. He's just waiting on us to pour it out before him. I, I've said this numerous times in these years that I've been with you. You know, it, it, I don't know that it, how in the world we're going to get the tears wiped away from our eyes when we get to heaven and see everything that God had in store for us that we didn't ask him for. All mounted up there. No wonder the Bible says over 20 times in the New Testament alone. Ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. When you put those three words together, you have the acrostic of A-S-K. It all goes back to asking God to meet the needs. One of my favorite Old Testament verses is Jeremiah 33, 3. Call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things that you could never figure out on your own. What a powerful word. And that's exactly what Daniel did. He got his buddies together and they go before God and they pour out their request to God. I, I want to say something to you. Daniel and all of the wise men of Babylon could have never come up with the answer to Nebuchadnezzar's request in a million years on their own. They would have never figured out what the dream was, much less the interpretation of that dream. Ladies and gentlemen, listen very carefully what I'm about to tell you. There are some things that are going on in your life today that you're never going to figure out. You're never going to find the answers to. And it's only God who could provide those solutions. It's only God who can meet those needs. It's only God that can provide the answers. I, I want to say this to you and hear my heart a minute. The storehouse of heaven is never locked until we shut our mouth in request. It's always open. Here's, here's, a, here's a tough question for you. I wonder what you've already missed out on from God because you never asked him. Here's the deal. It is don't just ask him. Expect God to do something about it. You can expect the response. If you go around and say, well, you know, God, I, I need this right here. But, you know, I know you probably, it's probably not your will and it's probably not in your plan. And, and God, I really don't expect you to do anything about it. But Lord, here's, well, you know what? You're exactly right. You don't, you're not going to get anything from God because you didn't expect him to do anything about it to start with. You've got to pray in faith believing. You've got to pray and trust that God is able to meet your need because God moves in response to faith and trust. The Word says, uh, if you and I know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more does our Heavenly Father 
know how to give better gifts to his children than we do. So, so turn over in your Bible just a minute to James uh, 1, one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And I want you to look at verse 5. James chapter 1, verse 5. Here's what the Bible says. But if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that gives to all men liberally, and he does not withhold it, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, don't doubt it. For he that doubts and wavers and waffles back and forth is like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything from God. So you got to believe. Let me give you number six as I hurry through. You ready? I like number six. I, I really do. Um, you got to praise and worship God. You got to praise and worship God. Uh, notice uh, with me, if you will, verse 19. I'm back in Daniel 2. Then was the secret revealed unto Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed and praised the God of heaven. All right, now watch this with me for a minute uh, because it, it really, I'm, I'm glad I'm secure in, in the Lord uh, because if I weren't secure in the Lord, based on the opinion of the majority of the people that come to church, I'd be a mess. Because the fact of the matter is, most people relegate praise and worship to music. And that's as far from the truth as it can be. Here, here's what praise and worship, look at me a minute. I don't know what you're doing in your house, but stop whatever you're doing right now. And I want you to focus in on what I'm about to tell you. Praise and worship is getting your focus of attention off of the distractions of life and the circumstances and the exigencies of your life and you focus solely on God. That's worship. And that's exactly what Daniel is doing here in this passage. He's got his mind and his heart and his will off of the fact that he's about to be assassinated and he goes and gets directly with the Lord and he focuses solely on him. He's been up all night long. He's uh, under the threat of an assassination and he's seeking God and sometime in the middle of the night, God answered his prayer. How many of you have stayed up all night praying about something? What is it in your life that is worth staying up all night and praying about? Is there anything in your life worth staying up all night and praying for? He labored in prayer. Now, watch what he did because it's powerful. The first thing that he did was that he praised God for who he is. Watch this in verse 20. Daniel answered and said, Blessed blessed be the name of God. I'm about to have a spell. I'm in this building about by myself and I'm about to have a spell just between me and the Lord. I, blessed is the name, name of God. Have you ever just read the Bible and discovered what a big deal the name of God is? God said it's a top tenor. When he gave it to Moses, he said, you tell those people not to take my name in vain. It's a big deal. Yet in our culture today, you hear it every five minutes, somebody taking the name of God in vain. You say, I, I don't do that. Well, you, you're just thinking of the bad ones that used to be there when we were growing up and, and the thing that would make me shiver the most is when somebody would say GD. That, that tore my nerves up. But let me just tell you something. Our culture is not any different than it was back in those days when we're saying OMG every five minutes. Oh my God every five minutes. That's taking the name of God in vain. You need to be careful. I think about the prayer Jesus taught. Hallowed be 
thy name. Daniel honored the name of God. Now, notice what he, he honored what God does. Notice this in verse 21. And he changes the times and the season. He removes kings. Notice he, he's doing all this stuff and sets up kings. He gives wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. In the middle of his prayer, you know, he's just saying, God, you're worthy. Lord, I honor you today because, Lord, without you, I would be nothing. God, you brought me out of the miry pits of sin and, and you set my feet on a rock to stay. You wiped the slate clean in my life. Lord, I, I honor you for what you've done in my life. But, but one final thing, what, watch this in, in verse number 23, because he thanked God. I thank you. You know, we really need to stop from time to time and just instead of asking God for stuff, we need to stop every once in a while and just thank him for what he's already done. He says, I thank you and praise you, O thou God of my Fathers. Well, let me give you number seven. You ready? Project to others what God showed you. Notice verse 24. Therefore Daniel went in unto Arioch, whom the king had ordained to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went in and said thus unto him, Stop what you're doing. Call off the dogs. Take away the death warrants. Don't kill anybody. Take me to the king. Because God has shown me what he's asking. Powerful words. You see, he's been up all night long. And he goes in before it, the one who was going to kill him. And he said, God's told me everything. I know what the dream is. I know what the interpretation is. Don't you kill anybody. I got this. It's all good. Now, you see what he, listen, listen. God's not only interested in saving you. He's interested in saving other people too. Through what he has done for your life. I shared with you earlier, you know, God showed me some stuff through this, this, this virus thing. But when, when, you know, I'll, I'll preach to 2,500, 3,000 people on a weekly basis. And the very first week I wasn't able to preach in this building. God let me to preach to 10,000. The second week he let me preach to 11,000. And I don't really know how many I'm going to get to preach to today. But, but I can tell you this. Each week someone has been saved through this ministry that may have never darkened the doors of this church. He saved us so that we could tell others about him. Look at verse 25. Then Ariok brought in Daniel before the king in haste and said this unto him, I found a man of the captives of Judah that will make known unto the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, uh, what, what, wh whose name was Belshazzar, are you able to make known? Now you can't, you can't help but hear the skepticism in his voice. Uh, are, are you able to make known unto me the dream which I have seen and the interpretation thereof? Daniel's answer brings me to the conclusion of the message. And finally, I want to say to you, point people to God. Verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king hath demanded cannot the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, the soothsayers show unto the king. But there is a God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and the visions of thy head upon thy bed are these. May I say a word to the audience here? Uh, in several foreign countries and dozens of states that are across America that are watching this program and those of you that are locally involved in this ministry, uh, your world may be falling apart and your back may be against the wall and it may look like that you are doomed and that you're going under for the last time. I want you to know there is a God in heaven. Your marriage may be on the rocks, 
but there's a God in heaven. Your job may be in jeopardy, but there's a God in heaven. You may be running out of money at the end of the month, but there is a God in heaven. Your health may be in jeopardy because of some virus, but there is a God in heaven, and I want you to know him. There's a God in heaven. Daniel wasn't taking the credit. 17 years old, it ain't bad, folks. He, he could have said, I know, I'm cool, I got it together. You know, all of these soothsayers, they couldn't come up with it, but boy, did I ever come up with it. No. He said, there's a God in heaven. He was pointing people to the Father. You, you know what? We may not be able to come to church together as the body of Christ right now, but that doesn't mean that you can't point people to God. You, you, you can point people to God in a line around Costco. Uh, you, you can point people to God at the grocery store. You can point people to God at the gas station. You can point people to God through social media. You can point people to God as you are going in this life. Take advantage of that. There is a God in heaven. And here's what I found out about God. The more people you point to him, the more he's going to give you to point to him. I don't have time to finish the dream, but Daniel goes in in these next few verses and he shares the dream with Nebuchadnezzar and then he gives the interpretation of it and he's just simply saying man's kingdoms here on this earth are going to crumble and be crushed but God is about to establish a kingdom on this earth that is going to endure and it's going to last forever. And as a matter of fact, Nebuchadnezzar, you won't be able to stop it. It's going to happen. Now I want you to listen to what Nebuchadnezzar did in verse 46. Listen to this testimony. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel. <laughs> he still hadn't got it yet. He's still not there yet. He's still got a ways to go yet. And he commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. <laughs> He's still not there yet. He still, it still has not registered to him yet. The king answered unto Daniel and said, now here he goes, he's made a little bit of a transition here. Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Oh, what a powerful word. What, what a tremendous testimony from a pagan king. All right, watch in verse, 40, yeah, verse 48. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested of the king and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel sat in the gate of the king. All right, here we go. You ready? What impossibility are you facing right now? Your back's up against the wall and you don't know which way to turn. What is it that's keeping you up all night long? What is it that's piling up on you? What is it that you have the perception that it's never going to work out? Have you asked God for help? Have you believed that he would? I want to pray for you right now. Would you bow with me right now? Please don't turn the computer off. Please don't go about your business. Please don't be a ho-hum right now. I want you to join me in prayer. And let's seek God about the impossibilities of our life. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Pray with me right now. Father... I, uh, I pray that none of us would allow panic to overpower our decision making. God, I pray that we'll back up a minute and we'll sit back and we'll think for a little bit, and slow down a little bit, and we'll bide some time for the solutions that may be ours. 
God, I pray that we would surround ourselves with people that believe in the power of prayer and will intercede on our behalf. And then, God, I pray that you would help us to expect results. Expect you to do something in response to our requests. So that, God, we would have a powerful testimony to point people to you. For those of us, God, that you have done miracle after miracle, God, help us not be selfish with that, but help us to, Lord, post it wherever we may go. God, I pray for those that right now are under the sound of my voice that feel like that life is never going to be any different for them, that they are uh, hopeless, helpless, they've been too bad, their sin is overwhelming, you couldn't possibly forgive them of their sin. God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would reject that thought in their mind and that, God, you would overwhelm them with the fact of how much you love them. That if they were the only one who had ever sinned, God, you would have still died just for them. And, God, you've already dealt with the big issue of this life, and that's the issue of sin. And beyond that, God, there's, there's nothing that's impossible with you. So, God, I'm praying for those that need to be saved. Those that don't have the assurance that when they die, they're going to go to heaven. God, would you touch them? Would you save their soul? Head still bowed, eyes are still closed. <clears throat> if I'm speaking to someone here today that is ready to receive Jesus Christ into their heart and their life, would you pray something like this with me right where you are, whether you're in your car, whether you're at home, behind a computer, on a mobile device? Would you pray something like this? Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus Christ paid my sin debt. And I know that I'm a sinner. And God, in the name of Jesus, I'm asking you to forgive me of all my sin. And God, with the help of your Holy Spirit, I'll turn away from sin right now and live for you the rest of my life. Come into my heart. I receive you as Savior and Lord of my life. Would you, would you look this way right now? You've done everything. If you prayed that prayer with me just then, you've done everything that the Bible teaches a person to do to be saved and go to heaven when they die and be forgiven of your sin and have a relationship with Jesus between now and then. And I'd like to ask you to do something. If you prayed that prayer with me right then, on your computer, on your mobile device, on our website, there's a place for you to go to give us your name and your email address and the decision that you have made this morning in your prayer time. Would you please let me know? Nothing, nothing would encourage me more than to know that God touched your heart and your life. So please take time this morning and go to that page that says, I made this decision. I asked Jesus into my heart and my life. Let me know that, would you? Right now, don't delay it, don't put it off. Just take time before you go do something else and just sign on and do that for me right now. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.